بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين um, it's been a while since we've had halaqa and inshallah everybody is refreshed i know having the kids at the house for a couple of weeks sometimes is not refreshing for the parents i know the kids are like yeah we got school off i saw a comic one time where um, first day of school after summer and the kids are like, oh, they're, they're so sad. And the parents are like, yes, <laughs> you know, alhamdulillah. So um, last time we were ending, it's um, ending up the, the, the topic of the rights of parents, birrul walidain, um, as per the Islamic tradition from the Quran and the Sunnah and the examples of the early generations, the Salaf and from the opinions and, and advice of the scholars. So we ended off on the idea of uquq and disrespect of the parents and that there are two types of uquq, one which is a kabira, an enormity, a major sin, and one which is a minor sin. And we discussed the difference between the kaba'ir and the sagha'ir, the major sins and the minor sins, and how the major sins require a tawbah. A person has to actually be conscious of what was done and go through this process of having remorse about it, being conscious of the sin, making an, an intention to never return to that sin and so forth. The sagha'ir, the smaller sins, Allah can forgive through many different ways. And any of the ahadith that we hear where the Prophet ﷺ says, you know, if you do wudu, then how many sins actually uh, are removed through the wudu when we do wudu how many sins are removed a sin a drop right every drop of the wudu one sin is washed away and because of this hadith certain scholars like Imam al-Shafi'i said for that reason you shouldn't wipe your limbs after wudu other scholars said no the even if you wipe the limbs Allah knows how many drops w would have been but it was that important and that much on their mind that some of them said don't even like that's it's sacred those drops coming off of your body after the wudu are are sacred now you don't want to take it too uh, too crazy you know sometimes you go in after somebody's done will do and it's like water world and they're like brother what happened and it's bad enough in the masjid especially if they don't clean up after themselves but imagine when they do that in public restrooms right so it's bad it's it's difficult enough for us to be known as the people who stick our feet in the sinks right unless you have one of those nifty alternatives everybody's got a or some people have a a, a hack a life hack around that um, of how, how to avoid that um, so also walking towards the masjid how many sins are removed when we walk towards the masjid one per step all of those ahadith that talk about if you go to the Jum'ah prayer jump between Jum'ah to Jum'ah your sins are removed if you do this your sins are removed all of that is talking about the sagha'ir the smaller sins the minor sins now when we say sagira a minor sin it's not to take away from that it's not to detract uh, from the from the fact that a person has disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because ultimately we don't know what Allah will hold us accountable for what he will forgive us for what he will reward us for there's one of the scholars Ibn al-Qasim he's the main student of Imam Malik and Imam Malik was one of the people the early generations who preserved the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. and his main student is Ibn al-Qasim so you can imagine how great of a scholar he is now somebody might think oh he's a great scholar what Allah is going to accept from him and put him into Jannah for is his scholarship and preservation of hadith and Quran and giving tafsir and, 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 and removing doubts in the minds of people from the deen and keeping the deen clear for the people after he passed away, somebody saw him in a dream. And of course, you know, if somebody sees in a dream, this is not, we don't have to believe in it, but interesting to know that this has been mentioned. You can believe it or not. The point is that somebody saw him in a dream and asked him, he said, Ma fa'ala Allahu bika, ya bin al-Qasim. What did Allah do for you? And just out of curiosity, has anybody ever, after somebody has passed away, seen them in a dream? And seen good news? You know, I've seen both. I've seen good news. I've seen bad news about people. Uh, one person I know, he said his, uh, somebody he knew passed away and never made hajj. 
But then somebody else, a friend or a relative of his, paid for somebody else to do hajj on his behalf. And then he saw the deceased person wearing ihram, but it was green ihram. And so, you know, it's just a beautiful sign. Here's a person who didn't make hajj, somebody made hajj on his behalf, and now he sees him in ihram. So people do see these uh, dreams. And there's another hadith that says at the end of times, people will actually see more clear and righteous dreams as glad tidings you know sometimes we think about oh this is akhiru zaman the end of times there's so much facade there's so much corruption things are going bad everything's going against us but at the same time there's actually more uh, spiritual connections that allah is giving the believers at the end of time and one of them is through dreams back to ibn al-qasim somebody sa said who what did what happened to you after death he said all of that knowledge that we had studied and taught was put to the side and Allah ex uh, accepted from me a few rak'ahs that I used to pray at nighttime. A few rak'ahs that I used to pray in nighttime. Not this high, 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 high level scholarship. That's what, what Allah had accepted from the person. So we never know which action Allah will accept us from us or which sin Allah will take us to account to. So when we say major sins or minor sins, it's not to distinguish that, oh, this is okay, it's, a, it's all right, you know, it's no big deal. Um, it's just to say, how do, we, how do we work consciously to remove those or even without even having consciousness of the, of the, of the sin, they can be removed. Um, just another point I wanted to make. Um, oh, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about a man who killed, he murdered 99 people. We're all familiar with this hadith, right? He murdered 99 people. Did Allah forgive that person? Yes. In fact, he killed another and made it 100. There's the, without going into the story, he forgave that man. At the same time, we also know a story of a woman who starved a cat to death, right? We know that story. Did he forgive her? No, not for that sin. The hadith says she will burn in hell because of torturing that animal to death. Now, what we can assume is she did not make toba before she left. This other man who killed the 100 people, as, 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 as heinous and as wrong as murder is, if he made toba and Allah accepted it before he died, he's forgiven for it. And here's this woman for a cat. So we don't know what Allah will punish us for or, for, or reward us for. We also know the, the, there's a story of a woman who had an improper trade, a business, you know, the, sold herself. And, uh, but she came to a well and there was a dog who needed water. And so she put the, her sock, her hoof into the well, brought water out for the dog. And Allah forgave her sins because of feeding the dog. So all of these hadith, when we look at them, the scholar said, never overlook three things there's three things that you should never overlook any sin don't ever overlook it and don't ever actually the hadith is you know or not that not the hadith is saying is don't consider it small any sin big or small sin don't consider anything s small because we don't know what what Allah will take us to account for where the sakhat of Allah is, where the anger of Allah is, for that we won't be, you know, we may be punished. The second thing that we should never overlook or consider small is any good action. Because we don't know where the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He intends to, to give us will come through. So we might give out millions of dollars in sadaqah and build hundreds of masajid, but then one day, we smiled in our brother's face and said assalamu alaikum and that's what gets us into Jannah. We don't know. So never overlook any good action. And the third thing, never overlook, never, um, um, it's not even overlook, a better word would be, um, hmm? Yeah, underestimate's a better one. Never underestimate, never overlook, never consider small, any human being. Any human being. Because you don't know where the wali of Allah, where that close protected friend of Allah is. Never underestimate them. There are, there are people who now we might see them and they're in a state of disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But 10, 20 years later or maybe on their deathbed, they make tawbah and they become one of the most righteous people on the face of the earth. How many people do we know in our lives that we've seen? And they're leaving a, a, a corrupt lifestyle. 
disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we don't see them for five years, 10 years, 20 years. Then we see them and we say, subhanallah. Allah guides whoever he wants. So you might see somebody right now, but don't judge the person by his current state. He or she may change. The other thing is you don't know what that person is going through and you don't know how sincere this person is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we don't want to overlook any, uh, any single person. So that's a, a short discussion on the kaba'ir and the sagha'ir. The difference when we talk about uquq al-waridain, disrespect of parents, there's uquq that's a kabira and there's uquq that's a saghira. The distinguishing factor between the two is Muhammad Mawlud says that if the disrespect or the disobedience of the parent causes them to become angry, then it's a kabira. If they don't become angry, you know, if it's something they request us to do, and then we just, you know, for whatever reason, we don't do it, and they're like, well, you know, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, and then they go on. They don't like it, but it doesn't cause the emotion of anger, that's considered a saghira. Again, it's not to belittle it, but it's just to show the level of what uquq, we need to avoid uquq in any style, but especially the uquq that causes our parents to become angry. On the flip side, for, us who, for any of us who are parents, it makes it that much more important not to tell our children, if they do something that makes us angry, we shouldn't say, hey, now you're doing a kabira. You know, uquq is wrong. But it should make us have more control over our, our emotions. Yarhamukullah. More control over our emotions so that if our children do something that we don't like, we really need to work on our emotions so that we're not getting angry at them. Because then we're putting them in a, in, a, in a difficult state. Yes, we have the right as a human being to get angry for something. As long as we don't tr trans transgress the bounds of Sharia, we can get angry. We can be bothered. But now with our children, if they do something and we get angry, now we've put them in a state of uquq. So at the end of the text, Muhammad Mulud is actually going to mention, he said, to the parents and to anybody who has a right, a haq, over somebody else, help that person. Help them fulfill their bir their righteousness towards you and avoid their uquq with you by lessening what you require. Like that threshold of, of what they need to do to make you happy should go down and the threshold and the bare minimum of what, they, of what they do to make you angry should go up. We should build our tolerance. At the same time, they should also be building their respect and saying, okay, I don't want to bother my mom or, or my mom or my father, but we don't want to become tyrants and we don't want to turn the relationship toxic by using our uh, right of, uh, of, of, of the parents. And he says, watch out because this is from the Muharramat, the, the, um, the, the sins that your entire body could do. So there are certain things like, for example, ghibah, backbiting. How do you do backbiting? With your tongue. Right? But there's another type of ghibah as well. Because ghibah is defined as mentioning anything about your fellow in their absence that if they were to hear, they would not like. And this is if it's true. People say, Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet, وسلم, what if it's true? He said, that's ghibah. If it's not true, then it's a lie against the person. But if we, if we say something about our fellow in their absence, and they don't like it if they, if they were to hear it, that's ghiba. Whether it's spoken or if it's typed, because people can do it in text messages or, or writing. And there's even a form where if, if somebody like winks, like, hey, you know, winks at a person, hey, check him out, right? We could say somebody is walking and he's got something that we could make fun of him for, whatever it might be. And instead of saying something, hey, look at that person, he's doing whatever, ha ha ha, we just nudge the person, nudge them. And point to that. Who's seen that before? Especially in, in school, right? Growing up, kids like, or winking, you know. So pointing and winking and nudging, does anybody know where that's addressed in the Quran? It's in a surah that we recite all the time. Hmm? Yes, thank you, brother. Surah Al Humaza. Wailun li kulli humaza lumaza. We, all, we read this all the time, but this is why it's so important to understand what we're reading so we're not just going through the motions. 
Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said at the end of time, people would leave the book. All of those ahadith that talk about leaving their book, leaving their book. He said it's not that they, the Muslims not going to read their book. It's they're going to read their book and not know what, they, what it's saying. So we have to read the book and see what it's saying and it'll have that much more impact on us. Even if we don't know what it's saying, it still has impact. But if we know what it's saying, it has more impact. It's the same thing like when we go outside and we look at the stars. Even if you don't uh, know astronomy and you look at, especially when it's a clear sky, you look at the stars, you see everything, what is a Muslim going to say? Subhanallah. Right? Allahu Akbar. You don't even know, have, no, have to know what's going on, but you can imagine, you say, Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. You know. Uh, you start thinking about the eyes in the Quran where Allah talks about it. But if you know astronomy, you'll have that much more appreciation for what's going on. For the physicians in here, any physicians? Pick one. We have, when you study the human body, you be have more appreciation for what's going on here, right? For engineers, they have much more appreciation for physics and wow, subhanAllah, look at that concrete and it can hold that, you know, or that electrical kind or whatever it might be. The more you understand something, the more appreciation you have for it. So if we want to have more appreciation for the book of Allah, we have to have more understanding. So here Allah is telling us in a surah that we're reciting all the time. What is wail? Wail means woe. Like uh, watch out for, beware, danger. But there's another meaning to it as well, which means there's a place in the in uh, a valley in Jahannam. Actually, a uh, whale is a um, a place in the hellfire, a specific place that the rest of hellfire is afraid of. And so this is where whale uh, lil mutaffifin, whale li kulli humazatin lumaza. You know that the, uh, everybody that does this, the the mutaffifin or uh, the 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 hems and the lems, they get whale. So what is the hems and the lems? The scholars differ. Some say hems and lems is pointing out the faults of others. Both of them are pointing out the faults of others, winking or uh, pointing. So with the eye and with the finger. Humaza, lumaza. Hems and lems. One is with the eye, one is with the finger. There, in the Arabic, you could use one for the, like, hems is for the eye and lems is for the finger, or the opposite. So they're interchangeable. But the point is, pointing out the faults of, basically, ghiba, but not saying anything. Just with a nudge or a pointing, or with your eyes. And so that's what Allah is saying. Those people who did it, and who do you think amongst, Med in Medina, who was doing a lot of that? Hmm? The munafiqeen. The munafiqeen were doing a lot of that because they didn't have sincerity. They would see a poor man walk into the masjid and they're sitting up there because they'd usually be, you know, at the back of the masjid, they could see everything that's going on and they're like, you know, look at that person. Or if somebody came to give sadaqah, you have some people like Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu or Abdurrahman ibn Auf, when they gave sadaqah, how was their sadaqah? How was their charity? Uthman ibn Affan one time outfitted an entire army. Fi sabilillah. How much wealth are we talking about? And there's other people who they only had the foot of a goat to give. Or they only have a half of a date to give. So for the sincere believer, if you see that, and this is why it's important for us in the masajid and organizations, when the donations come in, whether it's a million dollar check or a one dollar bill, we need to respect both donations. Because which one has more barakah? We don't know. We don't know. The hadith says, sometimes one dirham can beat out a thousand dirhams. So we don't know where the barakah is. You know, when they do those donations and the, and the little kids sometimes donate their, their, their coin jars. That might be, you know, if that money comes into the, the masjid, maybe the barakah, the blessing of that small donation prevents some financial disaster for the masjid or the organization. Whereas that million dollar donation comes in, soaked in riba and haram money, and then now all problems start happening in a family or in a masjid. How many times, you know, people hit the jackpot, the gambling jackpot. How many of those people who hit the gambling ja jackpot actually end up happy? It's all haram money. And now, and they end up usually in debt and they've lost all their, their friends and their spouse and divorce. It just ruins them. So haram money can really ruin um, a, a person. Okay, so there's different types of haram. Ghiba is with the tongue, but it can also be done with the fingers and pointing and the eye. 
But uquq specifically can be done with any part of the body. And this is what Muhammad Maulud says. He says, if it's with your hands, did we talk about this at the last halaqah? We did, right? Okay, so now some, I thought I was having deja vu. I was like, no, this is not deja vu. Okay, we're going to skip ahead. So watch out. Did we stop on the, the story of Juraj? There was the three stories. That's where we stopped in, right? Okay. So just as a recap, though, he says basically, you know, if somebody throws up their hands at their parents, rolls their eyes, you know, says something, listens to people talking bad about their parents, stomping their feet, walking away, slamming a door, basically any part of your body that you use to disrespect your parents, we're, we're using, you know, we're doing uquq with that part of the body. So then he uses a, um, um, a, a three stories. So he says these stories should, oh, we talked about these, right? We talked about the young boy who couldn't say the shahada at the, um, okay, uh, now I remember, all right. So then he mentions another hadith. Or before that, he says, beware of uquq. We should beware of being in a state where we're disrespecting or disobeying our parents because it will destroy your deen and your dunya. It will destroy our deen and our dunya. He also mentions a hadith that nobody will be, uh, there's three people that will not enter Jannah. Three people who will not enter Jannah. The first one he mentions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is the person who disrespects his parents, Al-Aq. The second one is the Mannan, the person who does good favors to people and then reminds them of, the, of their things. And I think we've all probably experienced this in our life. Somebody does us a favor, a few days, few weeks, few, you know, oh, remember, remember when I hooked you up? Remember when I did that for you? That's called men. And even if that original giving of that uh, help or that favor was done sincerely for the sake of Allah and he got reward, men will wipe it out. This is why Allah says in the Quran, says, لا تبطلوا صدقاتكم don't, don't invalidate your sadaqah with what? بِالْمَنِّ وَالْأَذَى Through men and other and bothering people. So there's men, which is reminding people of their favors. So if we give something to somebody, just as an example, could be anything, but we give somebody $20. A couple weeks later, he, that poor person comes around and says, please, you know, can I have... Remember, I gave you $20 last, you know, three weeks ago. Leave me alone. So now we're reminding them of what we gave to them. So that's why one of the adab and actually the obligations of sadaqah is when we give it, if we're really giving it for the sake of Allah, that's it. Fi sabilillah. We gave it, it's gone. Now, if that person comes back later and then we expect something from them because of that, some level of respect, some recognition, whatever, if we, and, we, and we demand it, that's considered men and it wipes out the reward of the sin. The benefit of, of, of Toba, though, is that if we make Toba from it, we get the reward back. So it doesn't invalidate it and, and we get uh, rid of it. So the Hadith says the person who does men, the person who disrespects um, his... Um, uh, parents and the person who is addicted to alcohol. Those three people will not enter Jannah. Now one very important thing to mention about any of these ahadith, this one specifically, any of the ahadith that say this person will not enter Jannah, that person will not enter Jannah. The scholar said we have to understand this within the a holistic understanding, within the context. We know that through other ahadith that the Prophet ﷺ says, anybody who says La ilaha illallah will get into Jannah eventually. Some people will have to be purified in the hellfire and we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from being from amongst those people. But ultimately, if a person leaves this world with La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and we ask Allah to make us from those people and to make our last words and belief La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. If we die on that, we're guaranteed Jannah. We are guaranteed. Now we're not guaranteed to die on that, but we are guaranteed Jannah if we die on that. Some people will have to be purified in the hellfire, but ultimately everybody will go in. So somebody might say, well these two hadith are contradicting each other. This hadith says everybody will get into Jannah. This one says there's certain people that will not. 
They said what it means is if you look through the, the use of speech, the balagha of the Arabs and just any, any language as well, there's usages of language that we study through balagha and understanding metaphors and figures of speech and so forth. It means that these will be some of the last people to enter Jannah. And because, you know, when the person is, 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 is left behind, so to speak, we all may have experienced the feeling of being left behind by our classmates, at a trip, by our family. It's a very, very sinking feeling. And even if you show up late, anybody ever been the last person to show up to a party, got left, you know? You get in there, but it was, it was a sinking feeling. You know, it's like, it's, it's like I didn't even, you know, get here. So, uh, so that's what that hadith means. The point of being mentioned in there that the aq does not enter is a, is a, should be a uh, warning to us to avoid disrespect of our, of our parents. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, said, if we cut off the connections with the friends of our father, that Allah will extinguish the light of the nur of iman from our, from our uh, the, the, they will extinguish the nur of our iman. So what is this talking about? Earlier in the text, he mentioned one of the ways to show respect to our parents is to keep contact with their friends, keep connection with their friends, and even after they pass away. So in the hadith it's saying, if you don't do that, if you don't keep the connections with your families, that's one of the things that can lessen the nur of, of your iman. So imagine, if cutting off the connection with the friend of our father can lessen the nur of our iman, then what about connect, uh, cutting off the connection with our father or our, or our mother? Then he goes into a discussion, um, it's, it's a bit long, uh, it's, it's, it's needed um, because he says, do not belittle your parents because of the fact of what some people say that, oh, all your parents did was bring you into this world. That's it. They're just the, the cause of your physical existence. That's it. Well, the reality is that's a big thing. Because first of all, Allah chose that for us, to bring us into existence, to give us a soul, to create us. And the pathway that He chose was through our parents. So to respect the Creator, Al Khaliq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the path that He chose for us of how to come into this dunya, we have to respect our parents. Okay, why does this come up as a discussion? Because there are some people who, 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 who preach a false message that your teacher or your sheikh has more right over you than your parents because your teacher or your sheikh gave you spiritual life and your parents just gave you physical life. So now we may or may not have heard that. As a, as an, has anybody ever heard that? No? Oh, one person. Okay, so one. So it does exist. It's not a, I won't spend too much time, but it does exist. And so he, 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 he goes into refuting this. He says, this goes against everything we know. If we just look at the Quran, Allah says, um, thank me and thank your parents. And we went through this. He didn't say, thank me and thank your parents if they're Muslim. He just said, thank your parents. When the Prophet wasallam asked the young man who came to make hijrah to Medina, are either of your parents alive? Go back and do their khidmah. Go back and serve them. He didn't ask whether or not they're Muslim or not. So it's the, 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 the respect that we give our parents and the honor that we give our parents has nothing to do with what they may or may not have given us spiritually, quote unquote. It's something that Allah has put in and we, we, we do it out of our, our duty and our belief in the, the Quran. So he said it should be enough for us to respect our parents. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran specifically told us to have shukr, thanks and gratitude to our parents. The only person that Allah told us to have shukr to was him and our parents. That's huge, right? And ashkur li wali walidayk. Thank me and thank your parents. He said it should be enough for us the fact that they're of, of their mention in the Quran. How many times does Allah tell us um, and take care and, and respect your parents and have ihsan in your parents. It's mentioned in a number of ayahs. The mere fact that they have this mention in the Quran multiple times should be enough. So he's telling us, we don't even really, if we really understood that, we don't even need to study this whole book on how to respect the parents. The fact that they're mentioned in the Quran should be enough. 
And people who realize this, who realize the importance of being mentioned in the Quran, they, they even honor the things that, that Allah mentions in the Quran. So for example, the Nahal, the bee. Is it haram to kill a bee? It's a bug. You know, if it if you know if it's coming to sting us, you know, we could we could protect ourselves. There's nothing specifically against, although in general we should not kill things just for the sake of killing. But the scholars mention specifically the bee, like if you have to kill insects, watch out for the bees. Why? Because Allah mentioned in the, in the Quran. If you're gonna kill a bird, say somebody wants to hunt a bird, say bismillah and, and cook it. That's permissible. Don't kill the hood hood. There's a bird called the hood hood. Why not? Because Allah mentioned it in the Quran and the hood hood, you know, of Suleiman. How many of us have seen a spider? And this I actually want to see a raise of hand. How many of us have seen a spider? And we think of the spider at Ghar Hira, the, the spider, right? We think about that. So we see a spider and we're there. Because Allah honored your kind by making a spider and a hammam and a, and a dove protect the Prophet ﷺ and uh, confuse the Quraysh to say, oh, there's nobody in there. There's a, a, a web that's been woven and a bird that's on, on, its, on its nest. Because of that, we respect the spider. Also, Surah Al-Ankabut, there's a spider mentioned in the Quran. So anything that's mentioned in the Quran, we feel like, wow, this is important. Usually, in the Arabic language, when the word kelb is mentioned, dog, is that a good connotation or a word or a negative one? Negative, right? But where is it mentioned in the Quran? Surah Al-Kahf. وَكَلْبُهُمْ بَاسِقٌ ذِرَاعِيهِ بِالْوَصِيدِ Right? His, their dog was, has, has its uh, two arms out sitting. Like he got, for lack of a better term, he got a cameo in the Quran. He got a mention in the Quran. We even know the name of that dog. I think his name was Qitmir. We know the name of that dog and they mention as a side, they say, look, this is the importance of maintaining good companionship, having good friends, suhba saliha. Because when the dog started following the young men who eventually slept in the cave for over 300 years, by being with them, Allah mentioned them, him, him in the Quran. At the time of Wahi, when revelation was coming down, the Sahaba were so, they wanted to be mentioned in the Quran so much that they actually tried to look for that. But at the same time, they didn't want to be mentioned negatively in the Quran because they knew if they did something, what would happen? An ayah might be revealed. So there was one story of a, of a man who went to propose to somebody. The Prophet ﷺ actually told him to go propose to such and such family. He came to the door, knocked on the door. When they said, who is it? He spoke, they were really impressed with his language. But when they opened, and he said, I came here to propose to your daughter, the Messenger of Allah sent me, so on and so forth. They opened the door, they looked down, he was short, not really handsome. They're like, no, sorry, not for our daughter. The daughter heard the conversation, she said, who was that? They said this was, they told her what it was. She said, no, go back and get him. Aren't you afraid that by refusing the, 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 the order of the Prophet that Allah will send an ayah about you? Because it could have happened at the time, right? So this is how conscious the Sahaba were about being mentioned in the Quran, wanting to be mentioned in a praiseworthy way. So it should be enough the fact that, the, that Allah has mentioned the parents so many times in a good, uh, in a good manner. He mentioned some other, uh, some other rulings. I will just go through them. The book is available online and I have actually the course uh, as well if you're interested in going through the whole thing. So now he says about Bir and about uh, stories in the, there's a number of stories in the Sira liter literature that we can find about Bir. I think we'll actually um, stop there. We'll finish it up next, uh, well actually maybe next week. Um, yeah, I'll finish it up like next week and that way I'll remember where I stopped off. There's three stories that he mentions. They're very powerful stories. Um, Yeah, so I don't want to rush through them. We only have seven minutes before nine o'clock. So rather than rush through those three stories, because they're very powerful stories. One of the things that, 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 that's a great teaching method is stories. So if you're trying to convey this lesson and the lessons of respecting the parents to your children, to other people, even for yourself to remember, these stories are very good for us to, uh, to remember. It's one of the reasons why we find so much mentioned as stories in the Quran. So in the last five minutes here, if there's any questions about what I presented specifically here today, please ask.
Yes. Like you say, you make uh, guna and you make toba like that. Like some people make guna and again toba and again yeah. guna and again toba. Oh, very good question. So the question was, if what if a person does something haram, does sins, does something prohibited, makes toba, and then goes back to that thing, and then goes back to that thing, and some people just keep, you know, keep going back. Well, if we look at toba, the process of toba, there's four things that have to happen for a toba to be actually considered toba. So it's not enough for us just just to do something and say, astaghfirullah. Mm, that's not toba. Toba is not even something that's done with the tongue. So you know sometimes people will say atubu ilallah, taiba ilallah, or toba toba toba, or astaghfirullah, or anything. Just merely saying that is not toba. Now, it's good to keep saying it so that we're just always still remembering it. But toba is a process. It's an internal process. It's a commitment to change. And now they have a, a, a modern term in like in psychology and in behavior change, it's called behavior modification. It's a very interesting concept. Look it up online, behavior modification. How do you actually change behaviors? And there's a process. There's actually five stages for us to change behavior, whatever it is, to, to change into a good behavior or to change a bad behavior. So they've studied it, they looked at it, there's research, it's evidence-based, it's interesting. When I looked at it, I said, this is our, our Toba process. We've had this, you know, before modern research establishes this. But basically, Toba is the first, the first step in it, and there's a, actually a khutbah, I believe I gave it here, or no, in another masjid, but it's online, and uh, the person who, who posted the video, he made it into a, a, an acronym, RISR, R-I-S-R. Those are the four steps for something to actually be considered a Toba. Remorse, intention, stop, return. So those four things. Remorse. Remorse is the fact that a person is doing it because they actually feel sad about it. They feel remorseful. Nadama. The Prophet Sallallahu said that, that Toba is Nadam. That's the, 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 the number one most important thing to have about this. So if say for example somebody's like does something oh, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. oh are you really sorry about that? For those of us, our parents, our kids get in a fight, you tell one of them to tell the other person sorry, and he's like, he or she says, mm, sorry. What do you tell them? What's that? Is that a real sorry? So when we're like, astaghfirullah, you know, the angels might be saying, is that a real astaghfirullah? The same thing we're telling the kids, the angels, the malaika, are like, oh, come on. I, is that a real toba? Is that a real astaghfirullah? So you have to say it, not only say it like you mean it, you have to say it and you mean it. So it has, there has to be remorse. That means a person has a conscious realization, this is wrong, I feel bad about it, it's not good, I need, I need to stop it for the sake of Allah. Um, so that's the first thing, they have to have remorse. If a person doesn't have remorse or stops something for other than the sake of Allah, he goes to the doctor, the doctor says, you know what, you need to stop drinking alcohol because it's ruining your liver. It's ruining your heart. It's doing this. It's doing that. You need to stop this because it's doing that. And so he, he or she stops that action for a health reason, for the sake of health. That's not remorse. That's you just feeling bad over your health. We have to be remorseful for the sake of Allah. That in and of itself might be a process to get to that stage. That's just the first of the four stages of toba. The second, remorse. And then an intention. Here's an answer to your question. We have to have an intention never to go back to that thing. That means we're done. If we feel, we might be remorseful about something. And we say, Astaghfirullah. But we know tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening, we're going to do that very same thing again. Toba has not happened. Toba has not happened. So we have to have an intention, a firm intention, a commitment to never do this thing again. The third one is stop. We actually have to stop it. There's people who might be, and this is an example, but it could be anything. Gambling, drinking alcohol, ghibah. You know, somebody's doing ghibah about somebody and they know in their heart, this is wrong, I shouldn't do it. And like, astaghfirullah, this is really bad, but I got to say this about the person, right? And I know tomorrow, I'm New Year's resolution, Ramadan resolution, whatever it might be, I'm never going to do this again. But I need to fi finish this, this ghibah because it's too good to let go. Okay, so the person, if they have to they have to stop right there. If they don't, every delay is now another sin. So when the person finally is ready, when we're ready to make toba, we have we, it might have been one sin, but all of those the, the delaying of it 
is actually more and more sin. So it makes it, it makes it bigger. And then the fourth is if that sin involves somebody else, we have to return the right to that person. If we've slandered somebody and ruined their marriage or their friendship or their business, we have to make those things right. If we've taken somebody's money, we have to return those things. So that's the process of Toba. If we do all of those four things, that's a complete Toba. Now, does, does that sound like a simple astaghfirullah? Or is that a process, in-depth process? So when we see Allah tells us in the Quran, وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Toba. Nasuha. So Allah didn't say just do just do toba. He says toba ten nasuha. The definition of nasuha, like a sincere toba, is these things. That means once we go through that process, that's it. We've changed. Now later on, if we fall, if we trip, we slip back into our old habits, we can repeat the toba, and it doesn't negate that previous toba. But it's a process. Like if a person say they keep going back to your question, brother. Very good question. If they keep going back to that sin, we have to ask the question, us or that person, were they making a firm commitment to never go back to it? I'm never going to do this again. Astaghfirullah. Atubu illallah. And then two weeks later, they fall back into it. Were they sincere in their first toba? Yeah. Were they weak at this moment? Yeah. Restart the process. So restart the process. And this, what I mentioned about the uh, behavior modification or the stages of change, they say the change is not a linear process and it's not even an event. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of like a spiral process. You keep working on it and working on it. And the, the points between those slips should like be spaced out. That's a sign of, uh, of, of, of improvement. Whatever it is that we want to work in, in our life. I know the, the, uh, the question I kind of answered a little bit longer, but I, I think this, this point about Toba is very important. Uh, there's some other um, advice that they give. Uh, they say, um, and these aren't conditions of Toba, but these are certain advice. Uh, Imam Nawawi mentions these in his commentary in the hadith, in the 40 hadith that talk about Toba. He says, one of the things that you can do is that if you sinned, if we disobeyed Allah in a specific place, go back to that place and do uh, uh, an act of worship and try to make it an act of worship that's similar to the sin that we did so if we went if we were in the marketplace and we stole something go back to that very sp place and give sadaqah to somebody if we spoke badly about somebody go back to that same place and do dhikr of Allah so that's one thing the second thing is also to to give uh, sadaqah to try to uh, work uh, like to, to almost like a self-imposed fine um, there's other things as well, uh, sadaqah, doing um, um, an act of worship in that same place. There was one more I was going to mention, I can't, I can't remember, but there's a lot in the discussion of Tawbah. And we'll finish, uh, or we'll continue this next week, inshaAllah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.